In your book, Why Marriage, um, you write the history of anti-discrimination is typically misremembered in at least two important ways. First, the history is almost forgotten. Why do you say that? Well, the history of LGBTQ people has been forgotten, in part because it's almost never taught. Um, I teach a big lecture class at Columbia every fall on U.S. lesbian and gay history, and at the beginning of the course this semester, in September, I asked my students, how many of them had gone to a high school where this was a significant part of the curriculum? There were about 240 people in the room, and five raised their hands. It's just not taught, so people have no way of remembering it. Uh, but I think it's actually more accurate to say that the history's been erased. Uh, inquiry into this history was systematically suppressed. I know that when I began my graduate studies and wanted to write a dissertation in LGBTQ history, I was cautioned against doing it because the academy was so unsympathetic to this, so unsupportive. And so for many years, historians of homosexuality were stigmatized almost as much as homosexuals themselves. And it really, uh, I think of this as just one aspect of the general effort to suppress the visibility of LGBTQ life and people. Now, before we take a deep dive into other anti-gay laws and policing, you wrote in Gay New York that the, quote, gay world that flourished before World War II has been almost entirely forgotten in popular memory. And you wrote that by the 1890s, gay men had made the Bowery a center of gay life, and by the 1920s, they had created three distinct gay neighborhood enclaves in Greenwich Village, Harlem, and Times Square, each with a different class and ethnic character, gay cultural style, and public um, reputation. Um, what does this symbolize, what people don't know about uh, mm -hmm. gay life in the early 20th century or the turn of the 20th century? Well, one of the most surprising things I found in my own research, surprising for me and for everyone else, was just how extensive and vibrant uh, queer world there was in the early 20th century. Uh, it typically was located in immigrant working class neighborhoods and in the early 20th century, by immigrant I mean mostly Catholic immigrants from Europe, uh, Jewish neighborhoods were rather different, uh, and in black neighborhoods where there were saloons and dance halls where people called fairies in those days interacted quite openly with so-called normal men. Um, they danced together, they um, initiated uh, social relations, sexual relations together. Uh, and by the 1920s, gay life had become incredibly visible in cities like New York, Chicago, some of the other big cities, where it moved from these working class neighborhoods and black neighborhoods into bohemian neighborhoods and then into the center of entertainment districts so that in New York, for instance, two of the three most popular clubs in Times Square in the early 30s had openly gay masters of ceremony whose entire um, persona uh, revolved around their campy repartee with uh, their, their customers. There were huge drag balls that hundreds and hundreds of drag queens and their partners and lesbian butchers and their partners went to, but also literally thousands of straight people uh, flocked to and bought seats in the balconies to watch the incredible spectacle. Um, and in Harlem especially, which had the largest balls, uh, and in Chicago's South Side, they were just uh, extraordinary spectacles, very well known, a lot of press attention. So this world was much more visible and gay life was much more integrated into the general life of the city in the early 20th century than we imagine. I think that's probably one of the maybe bigger misconceptions as well. People just assumed everybody was um, maybe closeted and scared to, to even um, live their normal lives. Um, but do you think, um, you also wrote in your book that, um, did it feel like New York City and other bigger cities felt like an escape or was this mostly a distinct urban um, phenomenon um, right. than compared to what, what, what was happening in the rest of the country? You know, so LGBTQ history is still a new field, developing field, and so we know much more about the history of life in cities than we do in rural areas. It's clear that there were social networks and various forms of connection in small towns and farm areas, but it, people needed to move to a city to really uh, create a larger commercial culture, 
cities provided people with anonymity uh, so that they didn't necessarily lose their jobs or families' support if they became involved in the gay world. Since you're big enough that they could go to one neighborhood and be gay and another neighborhood pass as straight. Um, and so many people did move to cities, which they saw as a site of freedom. This is true for many groups, that the city has always been a place that uh, where unconventional forms of life could, could take shape. You mentioned the uh, term fairies earlier. I know there's a lot of terms in your book that includes trade and passing. Um, to understand the, um, at least gay men in the early 20th century, is it fair to say that we have to define what male masculinity, how, how we define that and how it was defined back then? Right, so part of what's so interesting about this history is that it shows us how sexual categories are historically constructed and specific, but also gender norms vary. So in the early 20th century, especially in working class, immigrant and black neighborhoods, uh, the sexual categories were very different. Uh, you had on the one hand, men who today we might be more likely to think of as trans, that wasn't really a category that was operative in their own era, uh, who were gender nonconforming, often highly flamboyant, effeminate, sometimes thought of as women, sometimes and sometimes thought of themselves as women trapped in the wrong body, probably more often thought this was somehow expressed the gender difference that they felt. And it was also a way to signal to other people their gender difference, their queerness. Uh, and they could approach normal men, and I have lots of evidence of them doing so, and normal men felt free to socialize with them and even have sex with them without feeling that they lost their status as men, as normal men, because of this highly choreographed gender performance, uh, in which it was, you couldn't have a, as one blues song says, you know, I woke up one morning, wanted sex. If you can't send me a woman, send me a sissy man. It was just, they were options out there that uh, didn't confer a stigmatized status on normal men. So the way people understood masculinity, normal man, maleness was really different in those days. In the early 20th century, it you know, the way you, uh, you write in your book, and I think that this is what um, people need to learn about, is how the LGBTQ community was really flourishing. Um, how did prohibition affect all this, um, mm -hmm. especially in New York City? Well, pro prohibition had an enormous impact on this world, and of course on American culture as a whole. The, the point of prohibition by the time it was passed in 1919 was as much as it was about controlling consumption of alcohol. It was about controlling the working class immigrant saloon and suppressing the saloon. And so it basically it criminalized the sale of alcohol. Suddenly middle class people discovered this and it criminalized their nightlife as well. And it shut down a lot of nightclubs and hotels and restaurants that depended on liquor sales for their profit. And so a whole world developed in the big cities uh, where there, a criminal underworld ran nightlife and supplied liquor. Uh, and in that context, when the state lost all capacity to regulate this nightlife, it was easier for gay nightlife to emerge. It wasn't just gay spots that have to worry about the cops. Every spot did. A whole system of payoffs and criminal syndicates and connections with the police uh, developed to protect nightlife in general. So this created many new possibilities for a criminalized world like gay life. And eventually, as clubs competed with one another for an audience, they began to look for the most outre acts that they could. And so female impersonators, male impersonators, queer life in general became a, a part of the culture industry in big cities like New York and Chicago, which is why, as I said before, you had these nightclubs in Times Square that brought in pansy performers, as they were called, uh, who were completely out there. And people were fascinated by this because there was just no law, in effect, mm -hmm. governing speakeasy culture. Speaking of, um, before we, we go post-prohibition, um, 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 how was um, queer life in Harlem? I know that played a big role, not only for the black community, but for mm -hmm. the city as a whole. Right. 
So gay life was very open in Harlem uh, in the 1920s. Um, a number of the writers that we associate with the Harlem Renaissance were queer. I mean, typically tried to keep it sort of quiet, but people knew County Colon, um, Wallace Thurman, Langston Hughes is very enigmatic, but probably, uh, but also in the culture of everyday folks, uh, where in the cellar clubs where, and rent parties where poor people who lived in Harlem went to party, very open gay and lesbian presence. People were very aware of so-called women's parties that were just for women. Uh, it was very much a part of blues culture. So the primary musical form of poor African Americans constantly talking about sissy men and mannish women and relate their relations with more so-called normal folks. Uh, and again, the drag balls in Harlem were the biggest in the city. And lots of whites came to Harlem to explore this burgeoning black culture, but also were fascinated by the queer culture that they found there. Many people are familiar with the drag balls now because of the show Pose. Mm -hmm. um, what do contemporary Americans have to know between the differences between the drag balls of the 70s and to today to the balls of, of the early 20th century? So the drag balls of the 1920s and 30s, and really even into the 40s and 50s, were very different from the ballroom scene that we know today. The ballroom scene, in fact, emerged out of the drag ball scene in the 1970s and 80s. But in the 20s and 30s, these balls were very open. Um, lots of straight people went to them, were fascinated by them, wanted to see the spectacle. They drew a racially mixed crowd organized by black queens, but they drew whites and others. Um, and they got a lot of attention in the black press in the 1920s, which showed pictures of beautiful gowns that the queens had worn and so forth. So they really show you how integrated queer life was into black communities at that point. By the 70s and 80s, um, life had become much harder for queers in these communities. And so the ballroom scene is much more inward looking than the drag ball scene had been. They were not racial lines. They drew Latinx and African-American queers together, but very few whites there. Uh, and they weren't speaking to the larger black public the way the drag balls had. They were focused on providing a safe space for people who felt pretty brutalized out on the streets and homes and black neighborhoods. And so provided new alternative families and support for people who became a part of the houses. So I think it, uh, there's a, a shift that sort of marks the changing cultural politics of, of queer life in black communities over the 20th century. Speaking of changes, when prohibition happened, did that feel like the tipping point when policing um, got more rampant um, or did more laws come out of that to enforce anti-gay laws? So the end of prohibition kind of counterintuitively led to a whole new regime of surveillance of gay life. You see that most dramatically, of course, in the bars itself. Suddenly, bars were legalized again, but now bars that served homosexuals were singled out as still criminal, and they therefore had to um, continue to pay off the police, continue to have connections with criminal syndicates, which were the only organizations powerful enough to really protect them. And so after prohibition, the gay bar life was really pushed underground in a way that it hadn't been in the 20s uh, because it was criminalized when the rest of nightlife became more open. When you were talking about the bars and theater or the, the bar and restaurant committee went underground, what's the difference between going underground to what it was in the early 20th century? What we know today as gay bars really date from the end of prohibition and the legalization of the rest of the liquor business. Uh, before then, whether or not they were all illegal in speakeasy days or they'd been legal as saloons before prohibition, uh, gay life had been more open in these spaces, more likely to have social interactions between gay and straight people uh, whereas 
after the repeal of prohibition. Other places that served liquor were legalized, but in most states, including New York, the new liquor regulations prohibited a bar from becoming disorderly. And many state liquor authorities ruled that the mere presence of homosexuals in a bar made that bar disorderly. And so bar owners realized that they could lose their licenses and their whole investments in their small business if they allowed openly gay people to be served there. So some places decided to make the leap and turn themselves into gay bars and serve an exclusively gay clientele, pay off the cops, very often in cities like New York, organized crime got involved and owned most of these places. They were a good income stream because you could charge people higher prices since they had so few places to go. People flocked to them, but they were exclusively gay and the rest of the bars would not allow openly gay people to come in because they could lose their licenses. So part of what this caused was a new segregation of urban nightlife that separated gay and straight people from one another. Now, of course, there are always gay people going to so-called normal restaurants mm -hmm. and bars, but they had to be very careful in how they presented themselves and not make it clear that they were gay. You can feel the shift, it sounds like, actually. Yeah, you really feel a shift. In the 30s. Right. Um, so um, when we talk about this um, shift, um, the anti-gay regime um, of the early 20th century, what do you think is important for people to know about that change in the 30s mm -hmm. to today? Mm -hmm. So what's really new in especially the 30s, 40s, and 50s is the emergence of a legal regime that for the first time classified and discriminated against some American citizens on the basis of their identity or status as homosexual. So the state started classifying people as homosexual and discriminating against them. And we can see this in a variety of ways. One is in the bars, which began prohibiting bars and restaurants from serving homosexuals. We can see it in employment, both in federal and municipal employment. So the federal government during the Second World War, uh, for the first time, prohibited gay men or lesbian from serving in the military. Now, of course, many did, most did. They wanted to serve their country, defend the country, but they always ran some risk and 9,000 were um, pushed out of the military when they were discovered to be gay uh, and lost all the benefits that veterans had because of that. Uh, but then after the war in 1953, the very first executive order issued by President Eisenhower prohibited the employment of homosexuals by civilian agencies of the government as well, and actually required private businesses that had federal contracts to ferret out and fire their homosexual employees. Municipal governments around the country just did the same thing, prohibiting gay people from working for the, the city or the state. Uh, so the, there's, again, just this extraordinary discrimination. Uh, it extended to questions of representation as well. Mm -hmm. There was a mass censorship movement in the early 1930s led by the Legion of Decency, primarily a Catholic-led organization, which demanded a new federal censorship code to control what they saw as the immorality of Hollywood films and to stave off federal censorship uh, or the threat of mass boycotts, the Hollywood studios enacted a production code which um, tried to bring morality into studio films. Uh, you could still have crime, uh, extramarital affairs and so forth. I mean, how could you have films about crime and extramarital mm -hmm. affairs so long as they were punished at the end? But the code strictly prohibited including things that the church and others felt were so immoral, including interracial relationships, abortion, or homosexuals. Uh, they made them invisible for the next 30 years. And you can see here that the purpose was really to try to make gay life 
unthinkable uh, and just erase it from what was the most powerful uh, medium of the day, Hollywood films. Likewise, in uh, New York in 1927, after a, a serious lesbian drama was staged and translated from the French, and Mae West, of all people, threatened to bring a, uh, a play she'd put together called The Drag, uh -huh. which included a lot of gay drag queens she'd recruited in Greenwich Village, threatened to bring that to the Broadway stage. New York State Legislature enacted what they called the Padlock Law, which threatened to padlock or shut down a theater for a year if it let a play be staged on premises that included gay or lesbian characters. And so, again, you can just see this sort of suppression of queer visibility, the discussion of gay issues, and also an effort to exclude gay people from normal urban life where they might have been encountered by straight people in bars and restaurants and so forth, just to totally render gay life invisible. How it affected folks in the military and the folks who worked for the federal government. Here in Washington, everybody's, um, I would say most of the people here are pretty familiar with the purge um, during the McCarthy era. Um, not counting, you know, um, Hill staffers, um, members of Congress were all affected by this. Um, how did it affect, uh, especially folks who worked at the State Department and the and other federal government employees. At the height of the McCarthy era, so-called Red Scare, the State Department actually dismissed more employees suspected of homosexuality than suspected of being communist. There was a huge outcry because of the thought that gay people were working in the federal government, and new regulations were put in place both to prohibit them from working in federal jobs and to ferret them out, investigative apparatus was set up to, to find them. So this meant, of course, that gay workers here, but this is true for gay workers really across the country, had to be much more careful. Uh, I mean, there were some jobs, not for the federal yeah. government, some jobs which people kind of associated with gay men or lesbians where they were relatively safe, but for most jobs, to be identified to your boss as gay was a sure way of being fired. So people had to be much more careful about where they went, uh, who they told they were gay, and it had the effect, and, and in many ways, these employment bans had, were one of the most powerful ways of forcing people to keep their gayness hidden because the risk was so great that they were gonna lose their job. Probably like weaponized, you know, some members of Congress and some staff members, I mean, I've read some stories that, you know, committed suicide mm -hmm. in the 50s. Others just, they were so scared to lose their jobs. Um, they had very little resort of, of trying to, you know, c combat how it was done. How did they get around it um, um, of, of trying to at least live a normal life with this kind of hovering over them? So the threat of losing your job or losing your family's love and support were very powerful cudgels against people being openly gay. Uh, we often retrospectively talk about them living in a closet. In fact, that's a term that really just emerged in gay vernacular in the 1960s. Uh, the idea of the closet uh, suggests that people were isolated not just from straight people, not just hidden from straight people, but isolated from one another, often ashamed of themselves and hidden and isolated in the closet. In fact, in the 30s, 40s, and 50s, people used a different term. They spoke of living a double life, so that they presented themselves as straight when they were with their families or when they were at work, and then led a double life, and their second life their nightlife, their social circles, their dinner parties, and so forth. They were openly gay and socialized exclusively with other gay people who supported them and embraced them as gay, did not reject them on that basis. Uh, and so I think the, the double life is a good term. It's their term, and it's a good way to think about this. The closet as a spatial metaphor implies a very tiny space where mm -hmm. someone is alone. I think of the closets of the 40s and 50s as very large closets. Yeah. You could throw parties in those closets, and people did. And it's important for us to remember that people did create very extensive, rich, and rewarding social lives, even in the context of this very scary repression. 
all the threats facing them. And I, I think that's always a trick for us in thinking about the LGBTQ past, how to balance a, a recognition of just how severe the policing was with a recognition of how resilient people were in that context and how hard they worked to find other people, to create friendships, to create social circles, even when the straight culture, the dominant culture, is trying to keep them isolated and lonely. Speaking of resiliency, for the folks who fought back, like for the folks who got fired and wanted to kind of get their jobs back, um, they you know, received a lot of backlash. And then like um, the Manichean Society was created, uh, Frank Kameny came out of this, and most of these people who fought back um, ended up either being bankrupt or really struggling financially. Mm -hmm. How did this hurt them when they decided to um, you know, fight back and trying to get their jobs back? Most people, when they were threatened with the loss of a job, um, especially a government job, just decided not to fight the charge at all because they knew, in fact, there was a clear policy banning homosexuals from these jobs. They were gay and that to fight it would only make their life more painful and more difficult to have to go through a whole trial and inquiry and raise all these issues, have their lives investigated even more. So most people decided it was just the wisest thing to move on but it destroyed a lot of people's careers. Um, I have, we have all the stories of civil servants in Washington whose lives were destroyed. I certainly have stories in New York of people who had been very successful professionally or been successful in city government, and suddenly they were found out and fired and they could never get one of those jobs back again. And so were forced into lower paying jobs that were not nearly as rewarding to them as before. Then on the other hand, there were a handful of people, and Frank Kameny, of course, is the most famous example. Here he is, a trained astronomer, PhD from Harvard, um, works for the Army Map Service, and they discovered he'd been arrested once um, in California, and so he lost his job. Part of what made Kameny different was he wanted to continue working as an astronomer, and in those days, Almost every job that called on his skills was a government job or required a government security clearance. And so in the end, first he tried to deny it, and then he realized he just couldn't deny it. And he was so headstrong, he just decided he was gonna take on the whole government that had destroyed his life and just try to overturn this policy. So he filed the first lawsuits against it, went all the way to the Supreme Court, which refused to hear it. He appealed to every authority, went as high as he could, even appealing to the president himself, didn't get anywhere, of course. And after that, he became a full-time activist, living on almost no money. There were not big fundraisers out yeah. there, people supporting him, um, just had odd jobs here and there. But he became a kind of um, a, a counsel, unpaid volunteer counsel, uh, as other civil servants tried to challenge their loss of jobs through the civil service agencies and eventually was successful, but it took years and years. I mean, people are familiar with the human rights campaign now and PFLAG way before that, um, there were no groups like this um, advocating for the queer community. So um, when people tried to organize, um, they were so scared because they were nervous that the list of the people in this, I guess, group mm -hmm. may be passed on to police. Um, was that very rampant back then of people too scared you know, to work together to fight back? So gay rights organizing began long before Stonewall, but it was always pretty small and a pretty risky thing to do. I actually have evidence of one guy, a German-American, who discovered the German gay movement, which was enormous in the early 20th century, when he was a part of the American Army of Occupation in Germany after the First World War. He went back to Chicago, tried to start a gay group, he was raided, his files were seized, he went to jail, other people went to jail, they just completely suppressed that group. Uh, there are a few other small groups and then the Mattachine Society, primarily a male organization, Daughters of Elitis, a women's organization were founded in the 1950s, established chapters in a handful of uh, cities around the country uh, and did very important work in creating safe spaces for people, developing early communication networks where there's newsletters and magazines and so forth. But these were always very tiny organizations. 
most people were afraid to become involved in them. And in fact, they regularly had to promise people who were thinking of becoming members that they would absolutely guard their membership list because people were so afraid of their names somehow coming to the attention of the police because they were members of these groups. So it's really, um, those groups grew over the course of the 60s, but were still relatively small. And what's so dramatic in the early 70s in the wake of Stonewall is the dramatic expansion in the number of these groups and the mass number of people who became involved in them. Um, enforcing the laws in the 50s and, and the 40s and the 50s and the 60s, how did police actually do that? Did, uh, did they fold in like prostitution laws in there mm -hmm. to, to help really kind of enforce some of these laws and the liquor laws too, yeah. of course? So um, the clearest place to see how these laws were enforced is in how they were enforced against the bars. So the question is, how would the police know that a bar was a gay bar, yeah. attracted gay and lesbian customers? Um, when they were focused on a gay male bar, uh, one of the easiest strategies was simply to send in a handsome policeman in plain clothes, or actually sort of dressed in whatever the gay style was of the day, to go in, strike up conversations with other bar patrons, and to lead someone along and get an invitation home and then arrest that person and then charge the bar with having allowed a homosexual solicitation to take place on premises, which was very clear evidence in the eyes of the courts that this was a bar where homosexuals gathered. And so it wasn't just that one person who was arrested who was in trouble. The bar itself could lose its license because of that. But they also used all the sort of stereotypical signs of homosexuality, which again, still very connected to gender nonconformity. So I've seen court cases where the courts upheld a bar being closed because the police testified that they saw women with hair that was too short for a normal woman, or women sort of swagging around a bar, walking as a man might walk, or two women dancing together. Uh, you know, I've seen the defense attorney at a case yeah. say, haven't you ever seen two women dance yeah. together at a wedding? Mm -hmm. But that didn't really matter. This was a bar and they could use it as evidence. Likewise for men, men who were maybe wearing a little makeup or who called each other Mary or she or her, or literally in one case, two men talking about opera seemed like a sign that surely they must be queer because what normal man would be interested mm -hmm. in opera uh, or, and in any bar? people of the same sex dancing together. That was always the most dangerous thing because it was clear evidence that they were gay couples. And it meant that dancing was prohibited even in most gay bars, or it could take place only in a back room or in the basement where it would be hidden away. For people watching this today, they may think this is a very elaborate sting to get such, you know, it, people may call entrapped that type of evidence. Um, how, how often did they do these type of, of, of stings um, to enforce um, this against bars and restaurants? So the curious thing is that these regulations were always there and they always threatened bar owners. So bar owners always knew they could lose their license if a plainclothes investigator came in and saw something going awry. And so this turned the bar managers into the local enforcers of these rules. Yeah. So even if they knew that they were gay people there, they tried to regulate their behavior, not let them become so gay, either expressively gay or touching one another, dancing together. That said, um, there weren't raids every day. Uh, they were typically clustered uh, during crackdowns on gay life. In a lot of cities, those crackdowns happened in the few months before the election for mayor. And an incumbent who wanted to show that he was tough on crime in the city, tough on vice in the city, could order a crackdown on gay bars and get some newspaper headlines from it, show people that he was you know, a vigorous anti-crime candidate. And he could do that knowing no one was going to leap to the defense of these bars. The churches weren't the ACLU wasn't, uh, respected jurists weren't. Uh, 
So it was a kind of easy target for them. So in the bars that I've studied in New York, you know, some can go months at a time not encountering any real problem so long as they paid off the cops, kept the stream of corruption going, um, and then periodically there'd be crackdowns and the cops could show up two or three times a night. I know we've been focusing a lot on New York. Is it the same like in other cities, like whether it's here in D.C. or Los Angeles oh, oh yes. or Boston? A absolutely, absolutely the same in all the cities where gay bars operated. And one way that bars tried to protect themselves was, especially during crackdowns, was literally to put up signs that said, it is against the law to serve homosexuals. Do not ask us to serve you if you are homosexual. There's a famous picture of a bartender at a bar in Los Angeles uh, leaning against the bar with a sign behind him that says, faggots keep out. And that sign was there for everyone to see. And just a reminder that faggots, gay people, were a stigmatized outcast group that you shouldn't associate with. Hollywood was a big part of American life, especially the early, in the first half of the 20th mm -hmm. century. Um, how did Hollywood, um, who had a good chunk of, of, of queer um, actors and um, you know, people working behind the scenes, how did they enforce any anti-queer laws or, or how, and how did they get around it? So there are always a lot of gay men and lesbians involved in Hollywood as directors, actors, screenwriters, tech people. And in the 20s and early 30s in the silent film era, there were a lot of queer characters on screen. It's really remarkable to see uh, the kind of issues that Hollywood films took on. And in the early talkie era, they took on very serious issues uh, around sexual harassment at work, um, abortion, uh, and included uh, films uh, with homosexual characters. And as a result, there was a mass censorship movement which basically forced Hollywood on threat of a federal censorship code or mass boycotts of their films to institute their own censorship code, which prohibited the inclusion of gay or lesbian characters in films, along with other so-called immoral scenes. In 1932, you've got a film called Caller Savage, in which Clara Bow is taken to, a big flapper star, is taken to a Greenwich Village dive where there are gay waiters prancing around, singing songs about chasing sailors, and there are a lot of same-sex couples at the tables. That was the last gay bar cafe to appear in a film until 1962, when Advise and Consent was filmed. Uh, which included, included a gay bar scene in Washington. In between then, uh, so that's in the early 60s when the censorship code was collapsing under a variety of pressures. Between then, you couldn't have explicit representation of homosexuality, but there were still all sorts of codes that people used. And it, it's actually not just on homosexual matters. The studios were constantly dancing around with the production code and trying to include references to sexual relations, um, sexual innuendo that the code would have prohibited. I, you know, Ernst Lubitsch is a yeah. famous German um, filmmaker who uh, had what they call the Lubitsch touch. So <laughs> you'd see a man and woman get together, the man lights a cigarette, suddenly it goes, scene goes black, then he's putting on his hat and leaving her apartment. Well, we know what's happened in that scene, but it's not shown, so the production code would allow it to happen. Um, likewise, there are some incredible moments, queer moments in Hollywood films that are often, the words aren't used, but if you look at the images on screen, it's kind of inescapable what's going on. Because everything's so subjective, so how do they distinguish what they were calling sex perverts to something that they could really stretch into something that, um, that could be censored? Well, again, it's, it's all about the sophistication of the codes. And you know, I find that uh, in many ways, moviegoers in the 1950s were more sophisticated in the way they looked at films than most people are today. Today, we live in the world 
of the word. Things need to be said. And if you don't say it, I don't believe it, or I don't think it's really there. Whereas in the 1950s, any sophisticated person who went to a movie theater knew that the director was trying to communicate all sorts of things to them that they couldn't say. And whether we're talking about the banter between Humphrey Bogart and Lauren Bacall and The Big Sleep, where they're basically talking about, are they going to have a sexual relationship? Mm -hmm. But it's all about talking about horse races. Let's go back to New York and uh, Broadway. Okay. Um, it, 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 you wrote in Gay New York, aside from the village, um, many, the queer community also grew around Times Square because of the, um, you know, the theater community. Um, how did um, Broadway theaters and produ producers prohibit the portrayal of queer uh, men and women back then? So there, there were plays in the 1920s that dealt with homosexual themes, ranging from very serious dramas like a French play performed in translation called The Captive, about a married woman who was captivated by the charms of a lesbian and seduced into lesbianism. 1927, uh, the same year that Mae West, of all people, decided to bring two plays to the Broadway stage, one just called Sex, the other called The Drag, where she had recruited gay chorus boys in Greenwich Village to basically put on a drag show uh, in the entire second act. And this so outraged the press and the moral guardians of the city and state that the state legislature in 1927 passed a bill called the Padlock Bill, which threatened to padlock a theater, to shut it down for a year if it allowed a play to be staged that included lesbian or gay characters. And because Broadway, even more than today, was the central engine of theater across the country, and so many shows were produced on Broadway, that then traveled around the country, this law had the effect of censoring the representation of gay people or any discussion of homosexuality for a couple of decades. How about the balls in, in Harlem that we were discussing earlier? Did the same laws apply to them, the padlock law, or was it a different type of enforcement? The origin of the laws against cross-dressing, really unexpected, have to do with struggles over land tenancy in the early 19th century in upstate New York where land was being consolidated and there were a lot of small farmers attacking the bigger farmers and landlords and they were often going to masquerade to protect themselves, sometimes dressing as Native Americans, other kinds of masquerade. So an anti-masquerade law was passed. Fast forward to the early 20th century this law was used to prohibit cross-dressing. And so someone could be arrested for walking down the street and clothes assigned to the other sex and the one they were assigned to. Drag balls got around this because an exception was made for costume balls. And so one of the remarkable things about the huge drag balls in Harlem in the 1920s is that they often had police protection because they had applied for and secured a license to throw a costume ball. And it just happened that everyone in costume was a lesbian or gay man or genderqueer who was there masquerading as the other sex, so-called. Um, but as soon as the ball ended, midnight when that uh, license disappeared, people had to worry on the way home. They could actually be arrested on the way home. You touched uh, about this a little bit earlier. So with all these laws between from Hollywood to Broadway to bars, um, was this the start of the proverbial closet um, that we're all got accustomed to saying? Um, was it the building of the closet? Collectively, all of these laws were really designed to render LGBTQ life invisible to keep lesbians and gay men and genderqueers out of public spaces in the city, bars, cafes, restaurants, nightclubs, to keep them off the stage, to keep them off the silver screen, and in effect to render homosexuality invisible and unthinkable. And 
there was such a risk of being identified as gay, the threat of losing your job, being caught in a bar raid on a gay bar, um, so forth, that people were very careful to hide their involvement in gay life from their straight friends and associates. But that doesn't mean that they were hidden from each other. They developed an elaborate system of codes so they could talk with one another, even in potentially dangerous spaces. Gay is actually a good example of those codes. Before the 1970s, most straight people had no idea that gays had given gay a distinctly homosexual meaning. So in the 1950s, a woman who worked at a company could talk with another woman at the water cooler about how she'd had a gay time the night before, she'd gone to a gay place, and someone overhearing the conversation would just think, went to a fun place, a joyful place, a uh, maybe slightly outré place, but no idea that she was talking about her gay, lesbian life. Uh, and there were many, many terms like that, and people were also just more sensitive to the possibility of double entendre, that anything said with the right incident right intonation could have a, a second meaning, uh, a queer meaning that wasn't obvious in what was actually said. And this is what allowed people to communicate with each other in risky settings, in public settings. But they also created a very extensively segregated but all gay world in which they did feel free to drop the hairpins, as they used to say, to be openly gay and find support from other gay people. Uh, and so even people who were very deeply involved in this world had to keep it secret from outsiders. So I don't think the closet is the right term for that, the world they lived. I think their term is more appropriate, the double life. When and how did these laws start to get dismantled? Um, mm -hmm. Was there a tipping point when this started um, or was it a crescendo of, of different yeah. events? So one of the remarkable things about many of the anti-gay laws is that although we think of them as being very ancient and timeless, in fact, most of them were products of the early 20th century, and most of them were dismantled in the late 20th century. So take the bar regulations. Uh, mm -hmm. Repeal of prohibition, mid-30s, a lot of states enacted rules prohibiting gays from going to, uh, being openly served at bars, restaurants. Immediately, bar owners started challenging those rules in the courts. The courts first upheld those laws, and then in the 50s and 60s, both in New York and California, and possibly in other states, um, the state's highest courts began to rule that, no, you actually couldn't shut down a bar just because gay or lesbian people were there. Uh, so the police and the liquor authorities found ways around that and they continued to shut down those bars. So there continued to be a legal struggle. It's really only in the 60s in California and New York and then in the 70s and even later in many other states that gay bars were ineffectively decriminalized. But in fact, there have been occasionally raids on gay bars in just the last decade or two. It's not like it's completely disappeared. Um, the civil service rules were um, ended over in the, let me say one more thing. The, the regulations against gay bars were dismantled both as a result of determined activism by gay activists who challenged their criminalization, but also by the general liberalization of the courts and their growing respect for individual liberty and determination to protect people's liberty to have their own personal lives. Uh, the civil service regulations were um, partly dismantled in 1975 um, by the Civil Service Commission, but it's only in the 1990s mm -hmm that in the Clinton administration that um, discrimination against gay people was prohibited by the federal government. Uh, so there's sort of that crazy in-between period when you weren't required to be fired if you were gay, but you had no protection if you were gay. Uh, and it's also only in the 90s that gays were allowed to work openly in the most sensitive 
national security jobs. What uh, most people may find hard to uh, wrap their heads around, this all happened in a period of 50 years. Grace, how do you think we could learn from that yeah. period? I think there, there are several things we can learn from this history. One is that we shouldn't take anti-gay animus as natural, as an intrinsic response to the openness of gay people. Uh, that's sort of the psychological theory that underlies our idea of homophobia. And the trouble is that can't account for change over time. So we need to look at broader social historical processes to understand why in the early 20th century gay life could be more open and then why it was suppressed in the mid 20th century and then why it became more open again in the late 20th century. Those were historical processes, not individual psychological processes that can account for that. And I think one of the lessons that we can take from this is that we shouldn't imagine that progress on gay issues is linear, constantly progressive. It's very counterintuitive that things were more open in the early 20th century than they would be in the mid 20th century. And of course today it's really unclear where we're gonna go. There's much more cultural embrace of gay people, much more openness, certainly amongst young people, and yet there's still very powerful forces um, that still want to render homosexuality invisible, want to ban books in libraries and in schools and the teaching of these issues. Uh, and so I think another lesson that we can take from this is that nothing is static, history does not happen of its own accord, History shapes the possibilities of what can happen in any particular moment. It makes some things possible and other things just unthinkable and impossible. But what we do in those moments is up to us. Is history is always shaped by human action. And so history both limits what any group can do in any particular moment, but history is shaped by what they decide to do in collective social action. We started this conversation about talking about how history, LGBTQ history was forgotten. Uh, now that um, as one of the first LGBTQ historians, um, how do you feel now that there's more um, queer historians coming out, um, researching and documenting um, this forgotten history? Well, certainly one of the most rewarding things I've seen in my career is just the growth of this field. It was so tiny when I began. I wrote my dissertation in the 1980s and in the 80s, there was literally one other person, graduate student in the entire country, writing a dissertation on lesbian or gay history. Now there are multiple numbers of graduate students starting programs around the country every year. People are doing this work. Uh, it's hard to grasp just how little we knew about the LGBTQ past 40 years ago, how much we've learned, but also how much more we have to learn about this past. Um, but it is being taught more widely. People are hearing about it more on social media. There are more books available to them. Uh, and so I think it's an exciting time for the field to see its growth and diversification.